Hello, this is George Yates, and uh, that was a, we got a show that we had last week with uh, Jerry Morris of the uh, uh, president of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and I uh, had to run that show for a little bit because our today's guest is uh, uh, David Lowe from uh, um, he's from England, and uh, and we had a hard time uh, getting a hold of him and technical difficulties, uh, you know, this transatlantic stuff. So here we are again with uh, today's edition of uh, Justice for All. I'm George Yates. Thank you for joining us. If you've heard the few, first few minutes of our show today, that was. Uh, uh, actually, last week's show with Jerry Morris, President of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. And uh, this week, we have uh, our guest is David Lowe, and he's a, a professor of uh, law from uh, from England, actually from Liverpool. Uh, and he's the author of actually two books sitting in front of me. One's called Trends in the Judiciary, and the other is Policing Terrorism. He's a, a former a police officer uh, in England for 27 years. He's an expert in counterterrorism uh, and uh, in trends in the judiciary. He teaches law, and he lectures, and he's a frequent contributor uh, on uh, the media of uh, BBC, uh, both television, radio, and uh, in print media. And he's uh, uh, so he's with us today and to talk about trends in the judiciary, uh, policing, counterterrorism, anything else that, that might pop up. And if you've just joined us, I'm George Yates, and this is Justice for All. Uh, David Lowe, can you hear me? Yes, it's nice to see you, George. Okay, great. Well, it took us a while to get a, get a hold of you. We don't, we don't call uh, we don't call England uh, often enough. You actually are the third guest that we've had uh, uh, from uh, from uh, England. I had um, a barrister from there. Uh, we had uh, a Bob Browder uh, from London who wrote Red Notice, and now you. So this is kind of uh, this is our international show uh, today. Uh, and this and, and you've got these two books. Actually, these aren't your only books, are they? No, I've got another one um, that uh, looks at political violence. I've, I've had that one out as well, and uh, I've had a few chapters in books and a few journal articles, and uh, so I've been quite busy, really, since I retired from the police. I know it's uh, obviously being on radio, the listeners won't be able to tell, but I'm, I look far too young to have retired. But uh, as you know, the police service, they retire you early, so uh, in this second career, I've been quite busy. Well, 27 years, that's a long time to be doing anything. I've been practicing law actually longer than that. So, uh, uh, gee, I bet it doesn't look like retirement is on my horizon for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, you, uh, I got the policing terrorism book, uh, uh, and that is a fan. I, I don't know which one you're more interested in talking about today. Uh, you know, your trends in the judiciary is an interesting uh, volume. You actually send out interviewers all over the world talking to judges. And uh, your, but your background is in policing and in counterterrorism, so uh, we only have an hour today, actually less than that. Now that we had our technical difficulties, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you take the lead. What's what's on your mind? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk about the policing terrorism. It's uh, very topical at the moment, especially what's happening in Syria and uh, yeah, the the few diplomatic spats I think going on between uh, Western states and Russia and yeah, uh, and it, and a diplomacy going on as well as trying to counter the threat of Islamic State. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go with that one if you want, George. Yeah, I think that sounds uh, pretty interesting. What is going on? What's on your mind these days in terms of policing terrorism? I think the, the, one of the big issues, and I think this is a global issue, it's uh, about widening uh, surveillance powers on electronic communications. And, of course, post-Snowden, globally, uh, there's a big fear in uh, data protection and, uh, the prote you know, having l laws as well as practices that are, are protecting rights to privacy and data protection. But you look at groups like Islamic State, you look at how deaf they are exploiting uh, electronic communication, especially the social media. Uh, and it, it is a, a problem right around the world. I'm, I'm working with a colleague from uh, St. Petersburg University in Russia, so this is really interesting because, uh, especially when, when we have some l slight language differences, not so much between English and Russian, but between some phrases, and, uh, and it's interesting to have their perspective. They, too, have a problem. There's, we have a problem in Europe, and we have a problem uh, in North America, Australia. You, you, you can see the impact they're having. We, we had a 15-year-old boy uh, convicted this week uh, on Friday. He got a life sentence uh, for planning attacks of terrorism in Australia. He was doing it from his own bedroom uh, in his parents' house in, in a town called Blackburn. Uh, and that sort of sent a few shockwaves around. So I think this is quite an important issue. They're, they're, they're using this to radicalize. They're using this to encourage people to go to, that, uh, to the caliphate in Syria nor and uh, northwest Iraq. And on top of that, they're, they're also uh, encouraging those to, with their cause to carry out attacks uh, in 
uh, nation states where, where they're living. So uh, I think this is one of the key interesting debates that's going on at the moment, George. And so what we have is uh, last week I had Jerry Morris on my show. And, in fact, we just had his, uh, his, his that, that pre-tape running uh, before you came on. And uh, he, uh, at the end of our, our show last week, he talked about uh, the, this mass data collection that's going on. Uh, it, you as a counterterrorism expert, it, that, it's, that's the seem to be the, the problem going on. Snowden drew attention to that. Uh, uh, we we need these data collection uh, uh, techniques, I guess, to catch uh, these these count these terrorists. But at the same time, uh, we're spying on we're spying on ordinary people. How do you reconcile that? Yeah, I think and I think this is where you sort of get to the nub of the debate. And I sort of say, let's get the balance right. Um, and I think that the problem isn't so much getting an authority on someone who's named and to go and listen to the phone calls and the email access and so on. That's a different situation. It's where it's trying to cross-match uh, people on intelligence systems with uh, their electronic communications or communications that's ongoing. Uh, I think what is absolutely key to this, and it's something that the UK is a lesson it's not learned, and the, and the European Union uh, court, because we have to follow uh, the, the, the Court of Justice in uh, Luxembourg was on matters of EU law. Um, the whole point that they're, they're saying is if it's not a problem itself getting access to this communication data, but there's a couple of issues. One, let's have proper safeguards. And to me, the, 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 one of the best safeguards you can have is judicial supervision. And I know as I do my studies and, and, and I read cases from obviously here in the UK, I read the U.S. cases, Canadian cases, Australian cases, the judiciary is not frightened to say, no, you can't have that authority, or you are now exceeding the bounds of your authority. I think that's crucial. I think also it's being proportionate. And it's saying to uh, the service providers, because it's important for them, because the last thing they want to do is hand over all this data, because they won't be getting the customers through the door, and they'll be going out of business. So it's saying to them, look, where, where you're your systems are identifying potential terrorists, and you're closing down Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts. P please pass this information on. Uh, and it's, I think this is what it's about, is being specific. It's about national security. And it's also, on the other hand, um, having proper safeguards in place and having proper judicial supervision. I think what we saw with Snowden, and of course it was the Foreign Intelligence uh, Surveillance Act, is... The foreign intelligence surveillance courts themselves, they sit in camera. Um, and it was interesting, the Freedom Act, that, uh, with the U.S. Freedom Act in, in June, saying that uh, their decisions and opinions uh, should where possibly be published, although they did say it could be redacted, uh, key information. But I think this openness, I think, is important. I think that will pacify a lot of people. But doesn't the FISA court always approve every request? I mean, that, that, that they never really say no at all. I mean, any time the government asks for something, they get it, don't they? Well, you, you, I suppose you, you have this uh, impression. I mean, I know from my own experiences, um, when, when you apply for warrants uh, to unauthorizations, uh, the, the, there was a process to go through. I mean, from my own supervision, then it would go to a chief officer, and then it would go on. Uh, to either a, where a court could grant it, or in our case here, it was the Home Secretary uh, who, who gave the authority. But certainly the ones that were easiest was when you didn't have to go to court, because I have been knocked back in court, where I've been uh, saying, well, they say, well we, we need some more information. If you, if you wish this, you, we need more information. So you, if you go away and get it and bring it back and show us, then we, we'll grant it to you. But I know what you're saying, George, it, it does appear as though it's like a rubber stamp, the courts do it. And I think also with what's going on, that the courts uh, should maybe have that confidence uh, internationally to say, no, you can't have that authority. I think that what uh, I know Jerry Morris was mentioned this last week, uh, that the ways in which the government can do this spying is uh, beyond even anything that some of us can comprehend even now. There are so many uh, super secret ways of of the government uh, that, that a lot of us don't even know it. Is that your experience now? Is that there's so many new ways of doing this kind of surveillance that uh, it's it's really kind of mind boggling, isn't it? Oh, it is, and uh, and the amount of data that's there. But of course, one one of the key parts is, and, uh, and it's one of those points that I do guess and I do understand is. 
because you've got this fear of this surveillance society, which is natural. Uh, and obviously, as I said, post Snowden, everyone starts to have this fear. Um, a lot of agent, uh, heads of intelligence agencies and policing agencies have come out and said, we can't literally look at everything. There's too much out there. What we're trying to do is target individuals. And if we have names and you have names and we can cross-match and go, there we are, what it may show, and you see, one of the issues, I think, with, with the likes of Islamic State, it's not just about people going out there to fight. They're encouraging uh, young people. We, we, we've had quite a few teenagers here from good homes. They've, they've not been in any trouble before. They've, they've, uh, everything, they've, they've never been to court. They really are, if you like, model citizens on the surface. And they've been uh, induced to go over, uh, to go and live. And, and, I mean, we've had a number of young girls go over. And it's obviously, the, the, the issue is not the young girls going over to go and live there. The issue is who's arranging this, who's radicalizing, how are they doing this system? Now, there may be people on intelligence systems who are known, but it's that gap that they're trying to find of where's the connection. Uh, and it, it is that, uh, I mean, I'm, you're looking at this wide area of surveillance that's, if you like, what I would call clean surveillance, not like half the time I'll be in some uh, dingy little room somewhere for hours on end trying to watch someone. Things have really moved on now, and, and we're all using our computers, we're using our tablets, we're all using our uh, phones, which are many computers, so it's so easy uh, to have communication around the world, and I think this is what we've got to try and monitor, but we've got to do it with these safeguards. How is uh, ISIS recruiting these people? What is, the, what is the secret that they're using to get these otherwise good kids to go and, and, and join this group, which is barbaric? Uh, what, 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 what they've done compared to, say, all the Al-Qaeda affiliates, um, you know, uh, you know that Al-Qaeda and Maghreb, Al-Qaeda and Arabian Peninsula and so on, they've decentralized their communication system. So... Individuals who are out in the caliphate now, uh, they'll have their own Twitter account and a number of backup accounts because they know, uh, or any other Facebook accounts they've got, they know that if, they, if they're being uh, using cer certain words and, and certain phrases that, that the company will close them down so they have the backups. But by decentralizing it, A, it's personalized it. So you, 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 they could be talking to an individual. It isn't just this... Uh, screen, like a, a website or a blog, this is the actually communicating. And of course, the, the advantage they've got is because of the people who are in there from all around the world, they're using all the languages, so the, as well as English or the other European languages, Russian, Urdu, and so on. And so they, they, they've got this skill of communication. Uh, and of course, there's a number of areas. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to stick to the law and not go to the politics, because I think that's another Pandora's box if you try and look at the politics of the Middle East at the moment. But certainly from that perspective, and, and here's where you need international cooperation, because no one state can do this now on their own. This is an international threat that's, that's to, to all of us around the world. So it needs cooperation. It needs cooperation policing, through policing and judicial cooperation. Uh, and, I'm, and I may be a bit controversial saying this, but I think the European Union uh, has a great opportunity to grasp the nettle with the communication service providers and work on, and, and work on behalf of those countries that they have treaties with, like the US, Canada, Australia, and so on, uh, to, to say, look, because they, they, their law, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, the Court of Justice in Luxembourg recently had uh, a case called Digital Rights, and it struck out its own uh, legislation, uh, and it was all on retention of communications data because it wasn't specific and there were insufficient safeguards. So it's about all working together. Uh, I think that's absolutely crucial. And if, and if we're coming along and reassuring the companies, we're, we're not going to be data mining. We're not just going to take all your data and store it. We're looking for certain specifics. I think that could be a big way forward. Well, this is, uh, uh, I'm really excited to have you on the show today. If you've just joined us, I'm George Yates. This is Justice for All, and I'm with David Lowe uh, from, are you in Liverpool as we're speaking? 
Yes, I certainly am. I'm, I'm sat at home. Um, the only uh, uh, in, in Liverpool. those of us here in America just know about you know Liverpool. We just think about the Beatles, right? I mean, that's the biggest claim to fame that Liverpool has for those of my generation. <laughs> uh, but uh, David, like, I had a feeling. I, I, I had a feeling that uh, a certain uh, group with four people, uh, George, Paul, Renko, and yes. uh, will, will be mentioned. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's Liverpool. That's that's. I, I promise you, if you go to anybody in America and go, okay, what do you think of when you say Liverpool? You know, oh. Well, George, Paul, John, and Ringo. Uh, but yeah, anyway, but, but I'm with David Lowe, and he is a lecturer at Liverpool's John Moore's University's Law School. Uh, and you were a police officer for 27 years uh, with, uh, I guess, in, Liver in Liverpool there uh, uh, as a detective. Um, and you were uh, working at the United Kingdom Special Branch Counterterrorism yeah. Unit. Uh, you've worked in policing, terrorism. Uh, so... Uh, you're a, you're a real expert in this area. How in the world is it, and I guess back to ISIS, because that does seem to be the you know, flavor of the month, if you will. What, how, how was it that ISIS was able, they really did use social media and technology uh, to recruit members way, way better than, than we had any idea they were doing. Uh, what are we doing right now to combat that? I still think that they've got an advantage in this area, don't they? Yes, they still have an advantage, um, but I think obviously one one key problem, and this is a message that that, that comes out, um, is by them being in that area, it uh, in effect physically out of reach. I mean, we we good examples include you know those absolutely barbaric and brutal beheadings uh, of the aid workers and, and journalists uh, who are in the area, and. Uh, uh, and that character they called Jihadi John uh, and Wazi, uh, you know, he, it was so frustrating because he couldn't be arrested. No, the, 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 there could be no extradition the, 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 because of the chaos in the area. So physically, they have an advantage. And, of course, the other issue then is starting to use encrypted communications, and these service providers allow and obviously want encrypted communication. And I understand why, because... They want to protect their customers' data. But I think this is where, as I was from what I was saying before, is, a, is another good way of making that move towards it. Um, but certainly countering the threat in our own home states, I think, is uh, we're, we're, we're definitely internationally taking a lot of steps to do that. So hopefully, uh, I mean, this year has just been unbelievable, certainly in Europe. I mean, we had the, the, the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris. Right. Uh, then, of course, don't forget June when they, they had another attack in Paris and in, in France, then Tunisia. And, and on the attack in Tunisia, uh, certainly for the UK, it was the highest number of uh, deaths from a, a terrorist incident from the 7-7 bombing in London. And of course, the highest one we actually had was 9-11 was, was um, bombing because that, that, that incident, that was the highest number of UK citizens as well as uh, U.S. citizens and, and other citizens from around the world. Yeah, you know the um, whole the whole nine eleven thing uh, made made America feel like we were the only targets of terrorism. But we've been pretty successful in avoiding ba major attacks. But it seems like now it is being focused more on Europe. Um, what do you think about the latest uh, the Russian involvement? I know this is kind of uh, very very soon, uh, but that's just going to uh, create. Uh, you know, when you see the Russians getting involved in this uh, for whatever reason, uh, and who do you who do you back when you're in this Syrian war? It seems like there's so many bad guys you don't know. Yeah, uh, you know, which bad guy do you want to back? It seems to be uh, going in there. Yeah, and of course, here's here's the political issue. Of course, Russia's been allies with uh, the Assad regime. This uh, with the Assad regimes from the fifties. Right. Um, uh, because they've got a port there, a Mediterranean naval port uh, that they lease. So that's important to them for the fleet coming out the Black, Black Sea. And, of course, what's, what's happened this week, and uh, both uh, the U.S. and the U.K. have been critical of uh, Russia because Russia said we're attacking terrorist targets, initially saying Islamic State, but they've been attacking the free Syrian rebels uh, who have been backed by the West um, and given limited support. Because there's another group in here that we haven't mentioned yet is Jabhat al-Nusra Front, and that's an affiliate of al-Qaeda. So this is the problem, is trying to support, if you like, those anti-Assad. If you do do it, then you've got two groups that you don't want to help, and that's uh, the al-Nusra Front and Islamic State, because they, too, see us as enemies, 
uh, and then of course the sad do do we work with the sad um, and you I mean that they had negotiation at the UN at the beginning of this week just gone uh, where Obama and Putin were were, were talking uh, and that still seemed a bit frosty even when they went for the official photograph so obviously I don't think they made much headway I'm, I'm guessing there George but I don't think they made much headway um, because the whole point is you then got to open dialogue with Assad, and, and it was a debate that was being run here the week before. Is should the UK get involved? Should the US get involved? Canada and so on. Should we get involved with this and talk to Assad? Because if we do, uh, it was only two years ago, uh, you had both uh, the UK Parliament and Congress talking about potentially bombing Assad's positions, and now we're, we're having to sort of like work with him. And this is the debate, so it shows you how politically things can turn around. Because who's the greatest threat? Is it Assad, or is it, is it this group Islamic State? And I, I would come off the fence and say, it's Islamic State. Let's talk to Assad, let's talk to Russia. Uh, and if Islamic State are defeated, then we can have some sort of peaceful negotiations and say to Assad, look, you should introduce a democracy. That's the way we want to go. Um, and obviously Russia would say, yeah, but we still have our interests. So I'd leave that to the politicians at the end, but you can see the minefield uh, that there is in, in, in trying to get involved on the ground in Syria. I think it's okay in the air, but as they always say, airstrikes are great, but you need the ground troops to go in and hold the positions that have been being made secure, and that's not happening in Syria. Well, isn't that why one reason, I mean, there was a, a some people want to talk about going into Syria, but uh, th it'd just be a, a nightmare situation for anybody to put ground troops in there when you really don't know which side to back. People aren't wearing uniforms. It's not like the old way of even fighting wars, is it? I mean, you go in there and you know, I'm not sure who you're, when you've got that many groups, isn't that been the, the, isn't that one of the big problems is you're not really sure who you're backing when you're down there on, on the ground? That's right. Well, and of course, historically, we've seen it in, in other conflicts where they've, they've gone to back a group, and then at the end of the, end of the day, that group became a renegade group. <clears throat> but I think, I think, I think what, what one's, one sticking point is the experiences of uh, the 2003 invasion of Iraq, um, where, yes, we did start a conventional war. Uh, it, was, it was mainly, uh, you know, U.S. and U.K. UK forces uh, at the beginning at it, of, of that conflict. And then you see the growth of al-Qaeda in Iraq. And, of course, from al-Qaeda in Iraq, that was where Islamic State came from because they had the split with the al-Nusra Front uh, two and a half years ago. But you, you look at what uh, our armed forces had to deal with in Iraq is exactly what you said, George. Now you're not, looking, you're not fighting someone with an enemy uniform on. Who, who, who is the enemy? And this is the trouble with any issue like this with terrorism. I mean, my, my, my first spell in Special Branch was during the Irish Troubles, and, uh, and Liverpool has a very, very close connection with Ireland. Uh, well, it's like myself, I'm, I'm, I'm a Roman Catholic with Irish background, so I have an Irish parent, and I have family in Ireland. So Liverpool and Ireland has always had a close affinity. So here there were lots of safe houses for the provisional IRA as they're trying to mount their campaign on uh, mainland England. Um, but it was one of those where cause they weren't wearing a uniform and they weren't wearing a uniform in the northern six counties. Uh, it was problematic uh, trying to deal with it. So any conflict like that, and, and I think Spain's had it with ETA, uh, you know, you, you, you can go through a number of conflicts like this. Um, and it is a problem. Who, who is your enemy? Because you, you don't want to alienate everyone. So I think the stomach from or certainly maybe some political savvy is for the Western states not to send ground troops in straight away. And also, if you do that, you can alienate the re other people in the region and maybe uh, other supporters or those who have a slight sympathy for those groups like Islamic State or Al-Qaeda and make them, if you like, more radicalized, or well, if you could radicalize them more, uh, they would be, they'd, they'd cross the line from having sympathy to taking some action. So you you can see the, the, the potential uh, problems, uh, I think, if, if we did send ground troops. For me in that region, it would be better, certainly like northwestern Iraq, try and get the tribal leaders to turn against Islamic State. I and mean, that's one way forward and support the Iraqi army and the, and the Kurds who are fighting there. Uh, but, and, for, and for Syria, if you're going to send ground troops, and of course you've, you've still got the Assad government, you've still got Russia, who's a very powerful ally, so if you then encourage the likes of uh, neighbouring states to go in, 
uh, you, you can see the potential conflict, how that could escalate and widen. Well, John Kerry is apparently uh, really involved in this and is headed, headed back over there to try to talk to the Russians and figure out uh, what is the diplomatic end game. Where, where do you see uh, what's the what's the United States' uh, mission in trying to talk to the Russians? Where you think they're trying to figure out a way to say, okay, Russians, we're going to help you uh, ease Assad out, come up with a new regime that can then stabilize Syria. Wouldn't that be the right way to have all this work out? Yeah, I think so. And uh, well, first of all, I think it's really good that you've got the U.S. and Russia talking to each other, uh, certainly with, with, with the Putin regime that's in the moment, <clears throat> with all the events that's happened, you know, post, uh, you, with what's going on in Ukraine, and post uh, what happened in the Crimea, when, I mean, under, I mean, I sort of look at it, not, not sympathizing with it, but understanding that's to protect the Black Sea Fleet, because um, they've, they've always had the lease there, uh, to, to, to have that access when, when it was all past the Ukraine. Um, so I think that's brilliant, the fact that they're talking. Uh, and I think it is, uh, as you're saying, George, look, we, we, they, they've got to reach some compromise. Huh? And Russia will, will want an end game to this because it's affecting them too in the region. And I think it is a case of, look, here's a diplomatic uh, solution at the end of it. I, I, the, the one thing is you, you can't have, I don't think, the current Assad government there. They've, they've got to look at some form of elections. But what's, what's stopping... Um, Ourselves, the U.S. and Russia, uh, and I say ourselves, I'm not even European, because the EU could play a good, a uh, key role here, because uh, they've had success in dealing with Russia in the past. Uh, Georgia in 2009 is one good example. Uh, they've, they're helping at the moment the Ukraine, because part of the European Union, you've got Poland, Hungary, uh, Slovakia, Czech Republic, former uh, Warsaw Pact state, so they, they, they're able to negotiate uh, a lot easier than, say, the UK, uh, if you like, because there's still a bit of bad blood from the Cold War days between Russia and, and the UK, I think, still with the US. That's why it's brilliant that we're talking. What, what, do you well, suppose, uh, what do you suppose Russia's goal end game is? I mean, what, what do you suppose they have to gain by getting involved in all of this? Well, uh, I don't think the... Well, Syria has limited oil, but they've got their own oil deposits. I think it's more... Uh, one, they, they were a good customer for them, but if, I think it's their uh, air base and that port, I think, is important to them because, of course, NATO has similar with Turkey, so that's right on the border. And I think if, if there's a reassurance, yes, if you, if you negotiate with them and, and, you, and you maintain uh, your presence there, that we, we've got no problem with it. If it's about, you know, if you like policing uh, states to make sure that there is a uh, peace around the world. I think if that's a way forward, I know it may sound a bit naive by me and a bit uh, hopeful, right, but this yeah. is, I think, the end of the game we've got to try and do because what's the alternative? The alternative is have continued chaos, continued terrorist threat, and we don't really want to go right down the line again of a cold war between ourselves and the Russian Federation. I think these would be the last things, so I'm going to keep my fingers crossed there is some solution. Yeah, I mean, when you start seeing the Russians uh, going in and airstrikes in uh, Syria, which they've kind of been backed off of, you know, they have not, not been a active sort of imperialist superpower for many years, and it looks like that's where Putin's headed with all of this, with his actions in Crimea and Ukraine, and now he's into Syria again, and he's flexing his muscles a little bit, and okay, and you just wonder where all that's headed, but Every time any of these foreign powers go in, I mean, look what Russia's experience was in Afghanistan, and look what our experience was in Iraq, and now you're going into Syria, and you go, what in the world is, is your end game by going in there? Uh, that, that you know, and, and don't you just have, uh, when, but when he starts backing Assad, uh, doesn't ISIS just uh, begin to start t targeting Russians instead of, uh, you know, Americans and Europeans? Yeah, I think, and, and, and this is, as I said, I was working with a, a colleague from St. Petersburg, and this is a, a problem that uh, Russia is concerned for. I mean, they've, they've had, as, as we've had all around the world, but they've had their own citizens going out there to either join and fight or go out there to live. And, of course, they've, Russia's got their own problems with the Caucasus states. You've, you've got Ingushetia, Dagestan, uh, and those states there who are fighting for independence from uh rule from Moscow. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm sure most of the listeners will be familiar with Chechnya. Uh, Chechnya right. is quite peaceful at the moment. But they've still got the neighboring states. Uh, they're having terrorist incidents there. 
Islamist, and they, although they're Islamic, they're not jihadist, and they can't stand Islamic State. They, they say they're, they're doing us more damage uh, by, by threatening to carry out, if you like, jihadist-style attacks. And you're quite right what you're saying, George. There, there'll be nothing stopping them doing, uh, because, because we saw even uh, during the Chechen Wars, uh, you had the Nord Ost siege in, in, in that theatre in Moscow. You've had the bombs go off in the uh, Moscow Metro. They've had their own problems. And, and there was Volgograd uh, about 18 months ago uh, that they had two terrorist attacks there, the train station and the tram, and there was about 30 people killed in that. So um, it, it must be at the back of Putin's mind that there must be a concern that they are fearing the attacks from Islamic State. And that's where I think here's one trump card about working together, and I think this could be the way forward. I mean, we have worked with, with them in, in the past, I know they were the Soviet Union, but we did this about 70 years ago uh, in, in the Second World War, but it is a possibility that we can work with them and, and hopefully have a, have a good outcome from it. How is all of this counterterrorism and uh, being affected by this uh, refugee pr problem? I mean, that's got to be... Uh, I mean, are, they, are the terrorists... Uh, using the refugee situation to help their position? I know this is a big fear, and uh, I'm still in touch with quite a few of my former colleagues. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm talking quite in touch with a few of my former colleagues. And this is a, is a, a concern within, with, certainly within Europe, and, of course, they, they want to come into the European Union states, because not all European states are in the European Union. Uh, it was quite interesting because they have a, a treaty called the Schengen Treaty. The, the UK, Denmark, and Ireland didn't sign up to it uh, because we want to maintain our own port and border controls. But once you get on mainland Europe, basically, within the EU, you've got freedom of movement of goods, freedom of movement of people, but of course you have that. As we said years ago, you have freedom of movement of criminals, uh, and that's why there's, they have their own policing agency, Europol, although they don't have powers of arrest and so on. They, they're a facilitator for the member states' policing agencies like I was. I, I have worked with Europol, used Europol, very good, uh, very good organization, very, very efficient. Uh, but it's a concern they've got that all these Syrian refugees, yes, there will be bona fide uh, political refugees coming in, but uh, there is a fear that Islamic State has sent their own fighters over because they're coming in and it's very difficult to check these numbers. And that's why uh, you're seeing not just barbed wire but razor wire being put up in the likes of Hungary, Croatia, uh, and even blocking off the railway lines. And uh, when, an, when Angela Merkel said, oh, please come to Germany, uh, everyone's heading to Germany, it was interesting. They started to put some, some form of border controls in Germany and Austria and starting to block it up uh, because uh, this is part of the fear, is they're sending uh, some fighters over there to carry out some attacks. The, uh, the ISIS or ISIL or Islamic State... Uh, um Occupy quite a large territory uh, of Syria and Iraq. What is the uh, assuming that there's some kind of diplomatic uh, agreement, let's say, between Russia and the United States and European Union to figure out a way to transition Assad out? But Assad's not going to go peacefully either, uh, is he? Uh, but assuming you could do that, then how do you how do you get ISIS or uh, out of that area that they occupy? Don't they? Uh, they, they, they control uh, quite a bit of that area, and a, a lot of the people are, are sympathizing with them. What is the end game there? Yeah, I think this is, this, this is the nightmare scenario. And, of course, I think Iraq's a slightly easier one to talk than Syria because um, it is the Iraqi army who's fighting. But, of course, you know, uh, perhaps they, were, they, they still weren't trained sufficiently. They... They, they need a greater support, and I think that's why you, you've seen a number of uh, armed forces from uh, Europe and, and the U.S. go over to, uh, who are helping to keep training uh, yeah. their, their sport troops. And do you, do you think, you, do, you think United, do you think the United States pulled out too precipitously from Iraq? Do you think that we should have kept more people in there to uh, to back up that army? Um, it's a difficult one to call. I think hindsight's great because you can go. Maybe we should, because I think because uh, the U.S. stayed about another 18 months longer than, than the U.K. forces did. We, we were down uh, in the south of the country, um, but the main problems were uh, the areas that the U.S. troops had in that northwestern region, in that sunny region, which was pro-Bath Party, pro-Hussein. Right. Um, and I think that, that, that was part of the, 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 the problem. 
problems they were facing, but a point has to come where you've, you've got to let people have a degree of autonomy. Right. I mean, there's, it's still difficult in Afghanistan. That, that government's just about holding, but, but Taliban groups are growing in there, right. and those Taliban groups are aligning themselves to Islamic State. It just seems the more you go in and try to do it yourself with your own troops, the worse it gets. You just sort of have to... Uh, I mean, I, I mean, a lot of people criticize uh, Obama, let's say, for not going in, but you go in and it doesn't seem, it seems to get worse. That's right, because, you know, although you're going in for good reasons, um, it can be see, perceived as forces of occupation. And, right. it's great, and, uh, and return to a terrorist language, that's a great form. I mean, we now have a leader of the opposition here, Jeremy Corbyn, and uh, a shadow chancellor, which is a bit of a shock that they became uh, the leaders of the Labour Party here, but they're part of Her Majesty's uh, opposition. He's a big Republican, um, which is nothing wrong being a Republican. Don't, don't get me wrong, George. I just remembered you, you got independence in 1776. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but you know, uh, but uh, but not just Republican. They they're very pro. Then they still are pro Irish Republican. Uh, they have those sympathies, um, which whew, which has been a bit of a shock here. And that's the language they use. And 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 John uh, McConnell, who's the shadow chancellor, he 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 called the British as forces of occupation. And now this fellow was born in Liverpool. Uh, he is English, um, but as I said, we do have close ties with uh, Ireland. You know. I keep nipping over a couple of times a year to go and see my family and have a great time, a few Guinnesses and a few Jamesons. It's very pleasant. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the, whole, the whole thing is that you, you wouldn't expect senior politicians to talk with that language, and that's a language that, that, that you've got to be careful of, forces of occupation, and that's right. how it can be perceived. Right. And I think this is a problem. So how do you drive? So ISIS, the only way ISIS is going to be driven out of these positions is by homegrown troops, you know, you know, ground troops uh, from America or Russia are going to drive them out? No, uh, it, it, it could only make it worse. And, and you're right what you said. I mean, we're going back a few years there with the Soviet Union invasion of Afghanistan early 1980. They suffered, um, and, you know, it's, it's always been a thing Afghans have said. I mean, even from the days of the British Empire, the British went and they got a bloody nose for it too. Right. Uh, Soviets have... And, of course, I suppose you could say, in effect, we, we sort of did uh, ourselves and, and the U.S. troops that were in Afghanistan. We, we sort of did, but at least we, we, we've left a, a government in place where they do have elections. And Kabul is a bit more of a freer city, certainly a lot freer than when the Taliban was there. You know, women can have an education now, right. etc. You know, things that we take for granted in our, in our own home states, uh, you know, that, that has been a, a partly success story. Iraq has been a different problem altogether, mainly because of the northwestern region was pro sunny uh, Ba'ath Party supporters, and I think that's been a key problem. Right. So going forward, uh, in in uh, as far as counterterrorism, where where do you let's let's talk about you? We've only got about five minutes. Okay. Uh, where where are you headed? Where what is uh, you know um, David Lowe doing in the next let's say six months? First of all. If you've just joined us, I'm George Yates, and we've been uh, with David Lowe for the last, oh, say, 40 minutes or so. How can people uh, find David Lowe, first of all? Do you have a website or uh, some way that we can uh, contact you or somebody can read your other articles and journals and so on? Yeah, uh, I'm on LinkedIn uh, under David Lowe, um, and I know there's a few of us around the world. I've got my Twitter account. You can always get hold of me. That's David Lowe EFC. That's after my football club, Everton Football Club, uh, because there's already a David Lowe got it before that. Um, and uh, through, through Liverpool John Moore's uh, website, if you go on Liverpool John Moore's, you put my name in, I'll appear, it's got there. And if you want to read some of my work, uh, if you go on to ResearchGate, um, you will find my, some of my works up there uh, that, that you can access as well. Uh, but if you go on John Moore's website and my LinkedIn uh, I've got the list of publications uh, on there, but I've got a few things coming up now. Uh, in November, I'm doing some presentations to uh, intelligence and policing and, uh, practitioners in the areas, for, and it's not just in the UK, it's from around the world, so uh, I'll, there'll be some FBI officers there, maybe some CIA as well as MI5, MI6, counterterrorism policing, and uh, politicians in that area. So I'm looking forward to that, because I enjoy that bit. That, that's the bit where it's not just my academic ivory tower. 
I'm actually starting to contribute. Um, and uh, I've also got uh, a meeting with the Home Office doing some work in December. I've got so a few days with them early December looking at communications and surveillance of electronic communications. And it was quite interesting because a few months ago I actually went to Brussels to recommend that they have a passenger name uh, record data directive put in uh, for those travelling that we need a bit more information and, and not just within the European Union but have it there so we can work with uh, our uh, colleagues in, in the US, Canada, Australia, etc. Uh, so it looks like that's going to be brought in. So that I found that exciting, George, that I'm not just writing for writing's sake or researching. It's nice when what I'm doing is built on from a career from basically investigating individuals, arresting them and putting them before a court and, and where I would hope to get a conviction at the end of the day. I think every police officer wants that because they, they've, they've got the evidence there. I'm actually doing something now, perhaps on a slightly different path, towards policy and hopefully uh, influencing how some laws may. So that, that really is exciting me at the moment. Well, we're going to have to say goodbye. I really appreciate you being with us. Can you come back on the show again? Uh, I'd like to get a full hour with you again, and uh, we can maybe do a little update on the uh, Syrian situation maybe in a few months. Yeah, that would be brilliant, George. Yeah, if you're a couple of months, not a problem at all. And uh, hopefully we'll have the communication set up straight from the end yes. of this time. <laughs> well, we We'll, we'll, we'll get our technical, uh, 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 let's say, uh, house in order. All right. Well, thank you to David Lowe. You have a great afternoon. Thank you, sir. You too. Cheers. Thanks, Dale. All right. So listen, we're going to sign off for uh, another uh, Justice for All. I'm George Yates. We've spent the last few minutes. We had some technical difficulties trying to get a hold of uh, uh, Mr. Lowe, uh, who is uh, from uh, Liverpool uh, with us uh, this last 40 minutes or so. Uh, the books that he's uh, got here are Trends in the Judiciary, which we never really got to. But he's, uh, if you want to find out more about David Lowe, you can uh, go to the website for John Moore's University, which is in Liverpool. He's a lecturer there at that law school school there in England and uh, it was very great having we're having back on the show his other book is uh, policing terrorism uh, with David Lowe so every afternoon uh, on Saturday from two to three I'm uh, you'll, you'll listen to uh, justice for all that's uh, my show and uh, I'm George Yates uh, during the week I'm a lawyer in Virginia Beach this is my uh, I haven't given up my day job yet this is just something we do for uh, to advance the cause of criminal justice reform and other things uh, in America and worldwide so have a great afternoon and join us next week from 2 to 3 for Justice for All. Bye now.